In front of me is the new 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro processor. There's a lot to say about this machine, so let's jump right into it. This is Artist Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. This will be a longer video with a lot of great information spread throughout. If you want to jump to a particular section, I'll leave timestamp in the description below. Apple has announced a new Pro computer. This 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro that is running on the Apple Silicon M1 architecture, but has been scaled up. And they come in two separate processors. One of them is the M1 Pro, the other one is the M1 Max. These are going to be very interesting to test out as we go forward. But as of now, I have the M1 Pro in to do a testing. Before we get on to talk about all these benchmark and all these aspects of this machine, because it also comes in a redesigned package, let's talk about the test system and the reference system that I have so that we have a baseline for what I'm going to be comparing this machine with. So for these tests that I'm about to do here, I've added two machines. So obviously one of them is the M1 Pro at the end there that you see that has a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU. This is the base 16 inch model. It has a 16 gigabyte of unified memory and also the upgraded one terabyte SSD from the 512. I've also added the 13 inch MacBook Pro, eight core, eight GPU, and eight gigabytes of memory to this testing benchmark so that we can see how everything kind of performs together. In addition to these systems, I have a few extra configuration that are arriving in two or three weeks. So one of them that's coming in is a 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro processor. And this one, I just configure it with the base processor configuration, the eight core CPU, 14 core GPU, and also upgraded the memory from 16 to 32 gigabytes. I wanted to see if we get the base processor, are we going to lose that much speed? And if we give the system more RAM, are some apps going to benefit from this? So that would be a very interesting find. And I also have a top of the line 16 inch model coming in. This is the one with the M1 Max processor, 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU with 64 gigabytes of unified memory. This is going to be a really awesome machine. And it's going to be my main replacement for the 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro. Now, another thing too is that once that machine arrives, if it performs on main the metrics that I'm doing the testing here, much better than my Mac Pro, there's a very high likelihood that I'll probably be using this machine, the M1 Max 16 inch MacBook Pro as my primary machine until Apple released a desktop machine. We shall see if that's going to happen or not. So make sure you stay tuned for that. All right, because this is an entirely new computer, new processor, Apple owned architecture, there's a lot to talk about. And you can definitely watch many other review channels out there on YouTube because they've gone over many of those aspects. I'm gonna kind of quickly give you some of these feedback and my brief review of this, but I'm not gonna go and take time and really talk too much about them. I'm also going to show you a brief clip also from the unboxing experience, just so you can watch that while I'm going over some of these aspects. Let's start out with the design. The first time I saw this machine, it reminds me of a titanium power book. A lot more squared of design in general with rounded corners rather than the taper design that have come before it. Overall, I think this is giving Apple engineering team a lot more room internally to build a more robust thermal system, and I'm okay with that. On the 16 inch model, we do get dimension increases in many of the aspect and also a slight weight increase, but with the performance you do get out of it, I'm actually okay with this because this is at the end of the day, a pro machine. The ports are back, which is really great. So two of the ports that makes a comeback or three rather is a full size HDMI, an SD card reader, and also MagSafe. This is now the third generation MagSafe. And one thing you note about their MagSafe charger is that on one end, it is a MagSafe on the other end, it is a USB type C. And what this allows you to do is that if you want to use a third party power brick with your MagSafe connector, you can totally do that. Rather than having four USB type C ports, you now only get three Thunderbolt 4 ports. That's because one of them has been replaced by a MagSafe and also the headphone jack is still there. This is making the computer a lot more versatile. You can take them into meetings in the conference room, link it up to a projector with a full HDMI without having to worry about carrying a dongle. And this definitely helps out a lot. So the power brick, the 140 watt power brick that ships with the 16 inch model is Apple first scan charger. And what that means is it's a new charging technology, a new circuit technology that's inside the power brick that allows it to be smaller 
and deliver the same, if not more, power than the previous generation. On this one, the overall dimension is very similar to the 96 watt power adapter. It's only about an inch taller or so. And when I saw this on the spec page, I thought it was going to be much bigger. To my surprise, they pretty much compact the design down, which is good. And with Power Brick Talk, we also have to address fast charging because it is a bit of an interesting in situation between a 14 and 16 inch model. So let's have a look. So on the 16 inch model, you can only fast charge using the MagSafe charger cable. You cannot fast charge using the USB type C in the system. And because these system already come with a 140 watt power adapter, you don't have to worry about that. But when it comes to the 14 inch model, there are a few things that you have to note. First of all, if you choose the base processor that comes with a 67 watt power adapter, the recommendation is to spend 20 extra dollars and upgrade that to a 96 watt power adapter so you can do fast charging on the system. When it comes to the 14 inch model, you can fast charge through any of the ports. So the MagSafe and also the USB Type-C will work for fast charging as long as you have the 96 watt power adapter or higher. Keyboard. The keyboard on this generation feels, I think, a lot more springier in a way. It feels a little bit more mechanical than the previous generation have come before it. And I really like the feel of this much more than the previous generation. I wouldn't come out and say that this is like a mechanical keyboard, but it's a move and a step in that direction. And I really like the feels of the key much better than even the 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro, which I think Apple have definitely gone in and improved the keys on this generation compared to the butterfly keyboards that have come before it. SSD speed. I mean, it is super fast. I have the one terabyte model here, and this is using Blackmagic this speed test. And you can see that is writing at about 5,000 megabytes per second or 5,200 megabytes per second is reading around like 5,200 or so, which is actually really good for these systems. So as I mentioned in the previous video as well, the internal storage on these systems are going to be much faster than any external SSD you can get and link up to the system as of now. So configure the way how you want it, configure with more SSD space if you need it. The sound. I mean, I really love the sound on these machines and I was testing this by playing foundation and having the spatial audio on a laptop. I mean, that is just super cool. As you move around, you kind of get that almost like surround sound like thing. Uh, I mean, Apple have definitely done a really great job engineering this and it is an improvement from the previous generation. And this just pretty much leaves all the other competitors behind. So the mic and the webcam, the webcam is actually nested in a notch on this computer. But again, I don't really see the notch. I stopped noticing it because most of the programs just end up hiding it automatically or that is where the menu bar is supposed to be. The one thing that I will say I noticed about the notch is that if you have some programs that has a lot of menu items, it will end up moving it to the other side of a notch. And I find that very interesting. So if you have a lot of apps that are running on the background, they're on the top right hand side of a notch. Well, it going to end up covering that. So that's just something to think about there. But the mic and the webcam is really good quality. The webcam is 1080. It, it pipes the webcam signal through the M1 image signal processing on the ship. So I mean, the quality is really good. The mic so far in testing is really great as well. Next is the built-in display and calibration. There's a lot of things to talk about here. So I'm going to give you kind of the synopsis of it. And then I'll probably make a separate video about this later on. Number one, what I can tell you right now is that it is a mini LED. That means there are multiple zones on the back of this display and they can each individually light on and off or turn on and off. This allows the display to have really true blacks and also really, really bright whites. Because Apple have brought this XDR, extended dynamic range display technology from their Pro XDR display down to a laptop, we now get that benefit. But there are also some side effects of this as well. So one of the things that Apple was able to reduce in this laptop and this screen is blooming. For example, on my 12.9 inch iPad Pro with the M1 processor with the mini LED, there's a little bit more blooming than I see on this laptop screen, which is a great thing to have. The XDR display, when you're viewing high dynamic range content, it can ramp up to 1600 nit and pretty much stay there for quite a long time before it needs to go down again, which is a great thing for viewing HDR content. But when you're really just watching, for example, standard dynamic range content or browsing website in general, the display will ramp up in general to about 500 nits sustain. 
So that's just something interesting there. It also has ProMotion, which is a variable refresh rate that at the high point, it can refresh as much as 120 times per second, giving you really smooth scrolling and everything. If you're just a photographer, you can leave that on without any problem. If you do video work, you should probably go in and set a fixed frame rate. This way there's no pull down on your video clip. And there's something about presets, which is very interesting. So I'm going to jump out from here now and kind of talk about a few things from this display just to give us a brief run through. So the first thing is that the way how this display behave is very similar to the Pro Display XDR from Apple. When you click on display itself, we now have like this display. I'll click on display setting. And even though I have the display mirroring right now, just to do this demo in the recording, we can see that I have the built-in liquid retina display. In here, I can set the different parameters and I'll go through this much more in depth in a separate video. But for now, what's interesting about this is there are presets. And with these presets, you can choose the different creative craft that you want to do. For example, HDR video, NTSC video, PAL, digital cinema, and you have this digital cinema DCI, D65, design, print, photography, internet, and web. What you can't do from this drop down list is choose a color profile. So there's really no way for you to go in and choose an ICC profile on these display whatsoever. Can you still calibrate it? Yes. And I have a quick tip for you too in just a moment here. But if we take a look at, for instance, this BenQ SW271C that's linked up to it, the moment I click on this display, I have the option to choose the color profile. As of right now, the profilers are on the market. These are still what I would call a developing technology, meaning that the calibrators that we have are not going to be able to profile these display at the very best at the moment because the technology companies that are making this are still figuring out a way how to best calibrate these mini LEDs. And secondly, because of the way how Apple have implemented this XDR display by not allowing us to choose the profile, this may prevent in the long run any photographers from going in and calibrating your built in display so that you can do print properly and you can actually have the color be according to reference. So that's going to be very interesting there. And with all these preset modes, for instance, with the Apple XDR display and Apple display here, you can choose to change the brightness on your display. That's not a problem. But all these other modes from HDR down to the internet and web, these are locked in at a specific value that Apple has predetermined for you. But from here though, if you want to try to go in to calibrate your display, I found out that Calibrite Color Checker Profiler or CC Profiler works. What you want to do when you come into profiling is choose advanced mode. And when you choose a color LCD, the tip here is not to choose the PFS Prosper. What you want to do is choose the white LED. Based on a lot of testing with Calibrite and I have one of their people on the phone with me, I found out that the white LED tends to produce the better result for calibration. However, once you're done with the calibration process, there's really no way for you to set the ICC profile. So that's one of the things that hopefully Apple will make some changes in the future operating system. We shall have to see. So I've gone in and run through and did a display brightness measurement for all those modes. For example, the XDR and the Apple display, those are variable. That's why you see the VAR. But all the other ones, you can see the brightness that I've used the Color Checker Display Plus to do the measurement from, and those are all in nits. For example, what really is intriguing to me is that photography P3 D65, Apple have fixed that at 162 nits. If you're doing photography, well, you generally don't want your display to be at 162 nits. And what they have done with Design and Print D50, for instance, is make that 118 nits or about 120 or so, which is about a good range. I would generally think that internet and web should be like higher than the 82 nits that they have set. But these are just the interesting variables that they have fixed and you can't go in and change the brightness for these values. So hopefully you find this information helpful, but I'll do a much more in-depth video about this because we're going to take some time to talk about this in general. The bit depth on this display, especially when output to an external display, I still believe that we're still getting 10 bits. I'm going to do more testing on this, but so far that's what I've been seeing. That's what I have been observing with the programs and it tends to work. So let's focus on just the calibration aspect of it now. So there are pending methods from this display, as I mentioned, and some software compatibility. For example, Color Checker Profiler have the tendency to crash sometimes. It will successfully go through the profile, but there are certain times when the program would crash after it saved the profile. So 
that's one of those things where it is compatibility with the operating system that Calibrite will have to work on. So until there is a full set of software and a method that has been developed to calibrate these, there is not so much that we can do right now. Now, talking about external display link up to the system, there are no issues whatsoever with calibrations or anything like that. But there are some things that you may want to note. Number one is that if you want to link more than two display to a system, you have to choose the M1 Max. On the M1 Max, you can link four. On the M1 Pro, you can only link two external displays to the system. On a software calibrated display, that means any external display that you would link up to the system, majority of them out there, you can run through the calibration with CC Profiler without a lot of issues. Sometimes the program would crash, but you will be able to save a profile and still get a good color from this computer without any issues. If you have a BenQ SW hardware calibrated display, my recommendation is to always go in and use Palette Master Element to do a display calibration. What I can tell you is that the latest version 1.3.16 does not work well in Mac OS Monterey at all. So regardless of if you have a new machine or you have the previous generation machine, you probably want to go in and use 1.3.15 instead. And I'll leave a link to download that for both Mac and PC in the description below. Just remember that this is only for BenQ SWU hardware calibrated display, not any other BenQ display model. And if you have an SWU 2700PT, well, depending on the firmware version, if you have the very first firmware version, 1.3.15 even with this version still can't be used on these new mac os monterey just yet let's now have a look at the real world benchmark which is the most important part for this review starting with lightroom classic this is my daily driver i'm constantly importing editing and exporting files and being able to do this on the road faster is definitely going to be of great benefit but how does this compare to all the other system that i test before well let's see so, so far, my Mac Pro still beats everything out at this point in time. But a few caveats is that number one, I don't have the M1 Max processor in yet. I don't have a machine with a higher memory count on the system yet. Right now, I'm still using a 16 gigabyte memory machine. So we shall see if we add more RAM to the system. Is this going to improve the way how Lightroom is performing with file export? That would definitely be a great thing to see. Based on what we're seeing with the 16 and the 8 gigabyte, for example, the M1 processor from the different computers that have come before, we can see that adding more RAM will definitely give it more benefit, but I don't think it's going to double the performance speed or anything like that. And so far, if you take a look at the processor, this M1 Pro is pretty much running on the same exact CPU core count as the M1 Max that are the higher one. So, I don't think we're going to see much difference, but we may see more improvement when we add more RAM. We shall see there. But as we can see, this machine definitely beats out my 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro. I mean, heck, most of the M1 already beat those out anyway. But this is still even, I would probably say, like around 25% faster than the M1 processor that have come before it. So really respectable there. Again, it's really nice to have these kind of performance, but I was secretly hoping for a little bit more. Let's continue. Let's now do a export for all these 1000 files to JPEG full size 240 pixels per inch. Now, one more thing I want to add is that these are my group of control files. They're the same 1000 files that I use for all the export. Your group of 1000 files are going to be different in the amount of time it's going to need because the picture on those files are different. So just something to keep in mind there. All right, with this, the Mac Pro still wins out at 14 minutes and 55 seconds, but this is coming in at a second close, 18 minutes, 55 seconds. I mean, it's only really about four minutes longer. That's really not bad at all. But again, as we can see, this pretty much beats out all the M1 processor, including the top of line 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro that have come before it. So when you configure something for Lightroom as of now, Definitely go with more core counts, but we're now at the maximum 10 cores, so you really can't go beyond that. But like I said, we're going to see if we add more RAM, are we going to get more benefit from Lightroom? But this is not the end of it yet. I wanted to see how much more power efficient these new processor are. So I did a battery export test on the new machine and also my 2019 16 inch MacBook Pro. And granted, this machine is about a year and a half old. It doesn't have the newest, freshest battery anymore, but the battery is still functioning at normal conditions. So I ran the test. What's really interesting is that this M1 
Pro processor was able to export about 33% faster than the Intel counterpart. Not only that, it's only using 9% of the battery, if you see in the second chart there. So when I'm done with export, starting from full 100, this machine was hovering at around 91%, where this machine was hovering at around 51%. And this leads me to my next point, which is fan noise. Using Lightroom to test fan noise is perfect because Lightroom definitely pushed the CPU hard and it makes the CPU run hot. So this is what I found so far. On the Mac Pro, it runs pretty much science, I can't tell. On this 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro, throughout the whole time running on power and battery, the fan just pretty much ramp up as soon as I start to export. It is really loud. It's like a airplane trying to take off. Whereas on this machine, there is some light fan noise going on, but for the most part, this is really science. I am really impressed with this. Now, I really wanted to see though, how the M1 Max is going to perform and if it's going to remain science like this. I mean, Apple have done a lot of right things here. Definitely building a better thermal system, a more power efficient processor. I'm impressed so far. A few other M1s that I want to kind of point out is that on any M1s that has a fan, that's a laptop or an all-in-one system such as the iMac or the 13-inch MacBook Pro, I mean, the fan was running really loud. The MacBook Air is silenced because it doesn't have any fan, but the machine definitely run hot and it takes longer to export, while the M1 Mac Mini definitely runs silent still. So that is one of the big advantages of having a desktop that I find. But this machine, I mean, it's really impressive. All right. Lightroom Classic HDR merge using nine Nikon DA10 file, 36 megapixel to merge into that final photo. Let's see how this whole thing does. Obviously it performs pretty much on par with the other M1 processor have come before it, maybe a few seconds, like one or two seconds faster, definitely beating out any of the Intel machine counterparts. So that's a good thing to see there. Let's now have a look at a panorama merge. This is taking 14 Nikon DA10 files at 36 megapixel, and we're going to stitch this together to create a 314 megapixel image. Let's see how the program performed. So right now, the Intel Mac still pretty much outbeats everything that the M1 can do, but not by much. So here's a few thoughts and speculations about this. You can see that the M1 Pro is performing pretty much right in line with all the other M1 processor before it. Number one, what I'm thinking is that panorama stitch tends to be a one or two core thing. And this is also telling us that the core speed in general, a single core speed on these M1 Pro processors are running at very close to about the same speed as the M1 processor that come before it. And this makes sense because Apple took the M1 architecture and they scale it up to these machines. Now, this is also telling us that Adobe image stitching processes are really more optimized for Intel machine at this point, and they haven't yet gone in and optimized this for the M1 processors. That I think once Adobe have gone in and optimized the code for Apple Silicon, I mean, this has a chance to really make a big impression. So we shall see there. And let's now jump into Capture One. So I know a lot of you use Capture One. I use it every now and then for Tether Capture. And Capture One is a very different breeze compared to Lightroom, especially on exporting and the program usability in general, because Capture One tends to target more of the GPU core rather than the CPU for raw performance. And this is going to be very interesting here. So Capture One 21 import 1000 Nikon D850 files, and this is generating a preview to 5120 pixels. What we can see here is that this 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro processor was able to do that and complete this whole process in 28 minutes and 42 seconds, beating out all the M1 that comes before it by a pretty good um, like six minute margin there and definitely beating out the Mac Pro and all the Intel machines that I have, which are a really powerful machine. So really respectable there. But when it comes to exporting, it's a slight different story. So I have a few graphs here to kind of just show you. You can see that on the Mac Pro, you have the GPU and CPU, and also on the MacBook Pro 2019, there's a CPU and GPU export. And you can see that when we use the CPU for export, that is more like zero processing. It's much slower than when we use a GPU for export. Let's simplify the graph and just look at GPU export. So when we look at this chart right now, we can see that the M1 Pro is able to do an export in 
27 minutes and 34 seconds, beating out all the other laptops with the M1 processor, including the Intel with the Radeon 5500M. However, it has yet to beat out the Radeon Pro Vega 2 with 32 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. Remember though that that video card that I have in my Mac Pro right now is a previous generation video card. So it would be very interesting to see if a 32 core GPU M1 Max is going to improve the performance of these export, especially when it's utilizing all these GPU cores. Now let's have a look at Photoshop. So for Photoshop tests, I am using Digital Lloyd or Lloyd Chamber. Um, he is a expert in Mac and he built all these like script that allow Photoshop to automatically run and calculate time. And this is going to give a much more consistent result rather than me generating my own tests. So all of my tests so far, I'm using his resources and I'll put a link to his resources in the description below this video as well. So thank you Lloyd for allowing me to share this. So Photoshop speed in general, I've done many of the tests with two RAM configurations, 70% and 90% RAM. One thing to keep in mind is that these are percentage based on the available RAM on the system. I'm not sending it out so that the RAM is pretty much the exact same actual amount for all the machines. Um, but based on what we can see so far, when we run a Photoshop speed test using his benchmark, this M1 Pro 16 inch MacBook Pro definitely beats all the other machine. 4.3 seconds compared to even like coming in second is the Mac mini M1 at 4.9. If we take a look at this, once we bump this up to 90% RAM, something interesting happened. It takes a little bit longer, 5.6 seconds compared to 4.3. I find that very interesting, but I find this consistent across multiple time running the result. I guess these files are smaller and having more RAM does not really give it that much more benefit because it has to address more RAM in the system. That would be my speculation. Why does speed slow down a little bit? This is doing a Photoshop test again using his benchmark test using a medium size file size, 15.7 gigabytes. And we can see that when it comes to large files, as we stand right now, Intel machines still tend to do much better or having a machine with more RAM tends to do much better. So we are going to see is particularly for this test, if having a 32 gigabytes of memory, if we're going to see an improvement in time here and also on the machine with 64 gigabytes of memory, if this is going to build and give us any improvement. When we bump this up to the 90% RAM, you obviously see that the shards have gone longer, but Again, the result is still kind of mixed and my guess is that it's just not fully optimized yet. And also the system that I have right now, the RAM is still very limited, so we shall see. But another thing to note is that this is pretty much performing in line with the Mac Mini M1 because these are more single core performance. I think that having more RAM in the system is definitely going to give us an improvement. So, and Photoshop huge, 56 gigabyte file. This took a while to run. I've added two results at the end there for the 13 inch MacBook Pro M1 and the 16 inch MacBook Pro M1 Pro, which is the one that I'm using here. We can see that the performance on a huge file is pretty good. It beats out all the other M1 computers that have come before it, so that's a good thing, but it have yet to nudge out the two Intel machines. So it hasn't nudged out the laptop 16 inch MacBook Pro, and it definitely haven't come close to the Mac Pro 2019 yet. So this is definitely gonna be much interesting when we get the other machine with more RAM coming in to do testing. And lastly, because I do all these videos, I export these to 4K all the time. I'm obviously going to have to do a 4K export using Final Cut Pro and see how it performs in general. So based on this, it definitely beats out all the other laptop and also the M1 computers, which is a good thing. However, it only beats it out by like about a minute or so. It's, actually a little bit less than a minute that it beats it out by so genuinely I was hoping to get more out of the export performance especially when there is an encoding decoding engine on the ship I want to see though on the M1 Max are we going to see a much better time because Apple have doubled the decoding and encoding engine on that processor and I might also add another test where we're exporting everything to ProRes as well so this will definitely tax the system and also utilize that encoding engine to see how this whole thing performs so I'll keep you posted on that one. So best laptop Max for Pro right now. 
Any of these M1 Pros and M1 Max, I think if you are coming from the Intel generation, it's definitely a win. If you're coming from the laptop of the previous generation, it's definitely a win. But if you have a really powerful desktop computer such as the Mac Pro, well, it's kind of a little bit muddy and a little bit murky right now. So here are some of the minimum specs I recommend. And remember that you want to configure your machine for what you're going to need in the future, not what you're going to need today or tomorrow because all the components for this machine are all soldered to the logic board, meaning that you can't just go in and upgrade a single component, for example, upgrade a SSD or the RAM in the future. They are the way how they're built at this point. So get what you're going to need in the future so that you have a machine with better longevity. Let's start out with the CPU GPU option. If you're choosing a 14 inch MacBook Pro, as I already said in my earlier video, I recommend spending around $300 more and upgrading to the M1 Pro with 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU. Whether you're going to need this or not, you now have a little bit more extra performance that you can always utilize down the road should you need it. But if you configure it with the base machine, well, there's not a lot of room to maneuver there and you probably end up having to get a new machine in general or be stuck with the slower speed. So that's my first recommendation for CPU GPU. If you can afford to go to the Mac, definitely choose the Mac option because I think that's going to give you even much more performance in the CPU area. But depending on the app that you use and depending on the type of creative work that you do, this may be a little bit different story where there's no one size fit all configurations anymore. And I will share with you the result and what I think about that once I get the inner machine in to do testing as well. If you're choosing a 16 inch MacBook Pro, you're already starting at a pretty good base model which is the processor that I recommend you upgrade to from the 14 inch one. Again, if you have the extra funding and you can afford to go for the M1 Max in either the 24 or 32 core configuration, I highly recommend that you do, just because again, you're giving your system much more power down the road, especially for GPU performance. But one thing we're gonna see in all these computers is that once you have reached the 10 core CPU, pretty much everything is going to be the same at that point. RAM. Here's another thing that you want to consider and RAM, when it comes to like these pro machines on the M1 Pro processor, you can choose between 16 and 32. I recommend 32. On the M1 Max, you can go up to 64. So you can choose between 32 and 64. If you can spring an extra $400 to get 64 gigabytes of RAM, I think that would be a great thing to have. But so far, my recommendation is going to be to stick with the sweet spot and just choose 32 gigabytes for the time being. SSD, so let's have a look at that. I recommend going with one terabyte SSD because I don't think that 512 is enough for any type of pro work. You can start to load your apps in and you only just put a few files on there and your drive is filling up. I recommend choosing the sweet spot, which is one terabyte right now. But if you want a big, fast internal storage that pretty much beats out any SSD that you can buy in the market right now and plug in as an external device, then I recommend upgrading it and just spending the money to do that so you have a really fast, large capacity pool storage within your system. One thing to remember when you're doing this, the SSD on here is non-removable, is soldered to the board, so make sure that you have a good, solid backup solution so that if something ever happened to your machine, you have that data backup and safe somewhere. Here are some considerations based on your primary creative discipline and the groups of apps that you use. I genuinely believe that choosing between a 14 and 16 inch model, that the performance for the most part are going to be very similar to each other, that if there is any difference, it's gonna be so marginal that you're not really going to notice a difference. So choose a laptop for the size that you want. Secondly, on the 16 inch, MacBook Pro with the M1 Max processor, there is a high power mode, which I'm definitely gonna be testing that out and see if that makes any difference in real world performance or not. So that'll be very interesting to see. But overall, at this point in time, I would say just choose the size of the computer that you want. So if you are a photographer and you use mostly Adobe apps, my recommendation is to configure the 14 model with the upgraded processor to a 10 core, 16 core GPU. This is already the base processor for the 16 inch model, so you're fine there. And for the processor itself, you can choose between the M1 Pro or the M1 Max, you're gonna be fine. Either one is going to work just fine for Adobe apps. 
I would say definitely go with 32 gigabytes of memory at the very minimum. And if you have the funding available, upgrade to 64 to which you will automatically get bumped up to an M1 Max anyway. If you're using Capture One, I would definitely choose M1 Max processor and go with either the 24 or 32 core GPU. RAM, definitely go with a minimum of 32. And also if you want the most optimum possible, go 64. For Video Pro, I definitely recommend getting an M1 Max processor because it has double the encoding decoding engine on there. And you can choose between a 24 or a 32 core GPU. Definitely go with 32 gigabytes of memory, giving your system more room to do computational tasks. And if your funding allows, go with a 64 gigabyte configuration for the maximum performance possible. All right. So should you get one now or should you wait? That's a really great question because if you do a custom configuration at this point in time, the shipping for these computers, the ship time is already slipping into December and will probably go into next year soon. So if you want to lock in your machine, I would probably do it sooner rather than later. Based on what we're seeing so far, we started to have a picture. We don't have a complete one yet. If you want to wait for my more thorough and complete review, please do so. I would not mind that at all because I want to make sure that you are getting the right machine for what your needs are. All right, I hope that you find that helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Give this a like, subscribe, hit the bell if you're new, and remember, in art and process.